Well, hello, my brothers and my sisters. This is Mark DeJesus bringing you insights for your healing and freedom journey. Today, I want to address a question and I want to take some tangents and maneuver through some areas when it comes to failure, the fear of failure. What about real failure? <laughs> Many of you have heard me talk about having a failure mentality and my perspectives on that. And I'm going to get a little bit more into that. But I received a question of like, what about something that it can be labeled actual failure? And we're going to also look at the life of Moses and some advice that I would give him. <laughs> Interesting, right? I'll tell you what I mean when I'm going with that. But if today's broadcast is a blessing to you, go to marktohesus.com, where I love to help people in their mental, emotional, and relationship health, especially in getting rooted in the love of our Father and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and helping us to walk in the empowering ways that God has for us and to experience healing and freedom. So, Check out all the materials, resources, subscribe to our email newsletter. You get a free ebook, Experiencing God's Love as Your Father, a fantastic resource for your life and for your journey, something we all need to learn and process through. Be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel and anywhere else that um, you, you hear or watch these materials. So let's get into this. I received a question, great question, and it struck some tangents in me, so I thought, Let's take a little journey here together today. So whether you're driving on the road and listening to this or going for a walk or you're sitting down watching this video, let's talk about failure and how you relate to the subject of failure. So here's the question. Thank you so much for your ministry. I wonder if I could submit another question for consideration. I, I thank you for answering the questions I have previously. I wonder if you'd be able to address when we are living in seasons of actual failure. Now, I'm going to take that that phrase, and I'm going to put it in quotes, air quotes, actual failure, as opposed to having a fear of failure. I have been thinking of Moses, who through his disobedience was not able to enter the promised land. If he had come to you for counsel, how would you have advised him? Um, then she shares, um, honestly, I don't know how I would have managed thus far without your material. Thank you so very much, which is wonderful. That's that's great. Forgive me if you have material on this, po on this topic. I did have a look and could find about fear of failure. I'm living in a season in the culmination of many bad decisions. How many of you relate to that? Where you feel like you're in situations where you look back and you're like, there's some bad decisions there. I think all of us could do a reflection on bad decisions where we didn't make the right choice. We didn't choose maybe the best thing in the moment. Some of us could look back and go, my whole life could have been totally different if I were to make different decisions. What we often do though, is we look at those areas with disqualification, with shame, Many times when I sit down and talk to people, I have to remind them, and they're a little shocked when I tell them this. I'll say to them, you know, you need to understand that if I was in your shoes, was raised the way you were raised, had what I had in your life and experience, I probably would end up in some of the same decisions. I, I get it. I get it. Now, I'm in my world and, and how I've cultivated and how I've moved and how I've decided, which forms certain pathways. But we all have our journey, what we've been equipped in, what we've not been equipped with. And a lot of our bad decisions that we talk about are really us living out of survival mechanism. We only know what we know and we live out of a survival. And until we're illuminated to truth that sets us free, we kind of live in certain patterns. But what I want to bring out is some interesting perspectives I think are important for us when it comes to our failures, because many of you feel very disqualified about your failures or your mistakes or your bad decisions. When we reflect on the scriptures and see the people throughout the Bible, this is the wild west of bad decisions, character flaws, sins, mistakes, whatever you want to name them, it's all there. And what I want to share with you is that God works powerfully 
and redemptively in the midst of everybody's goofiness. The key thing that we that I want to remind you of is from the Old Testament, yes, the Old Testament, to the New Testament. There is a thread of grace throughout it all. And what I mean by that is both in the Old and in the New Testament, God is calling people to relationship. And in relationship, he works with them in their journey. And even under the old covenant of the law, you see God working with people in profound ways, both men and women, in really gracious, even under the law. And Moses is a fantastic example of that. So I want to I want to talk about Moses for a bit in response to this. Can you say, what kind of, how would you advise Moses? Well, first of all, that would be a daunting task. I'm not sitting there and saying, I have the, I'm going into my Charlton Heston voice. I have the words for Moses. (laughs) No way am I saying that. But I think there's some important observations that we can take away. Because Moses was known as the most humble man on the face of the earth, it says in Numbers. It's very interesting because Moses is credited with writing Numbers. <laughs> it kind of reminds me of, I believe it's John who wrote the passage of Scripture that says the disciple whom Jesus loved dearly <laughs> is written by himself. You know, there is a interesting aspect of Moses being called humble. You could even use, I I believe some translations say meek. But Moses wasn't always humble. In fact, he had some anger issues. Moses killed an Egyptian when he saw him beating a Hebrew person. I think it was a guy. Yeah, I think he was beating a guy. And, uh, And he not only kills the Egyptian, looks around and buries him in the sand. And then he hightails it out of there. Okay. So we could say he's got, he's got an anger issue, right? And he also has a fear of man, fear of failure issue because God goes to him and says, Moses, I want to use you. And there is something very powerful that we need to understand in old Testament culture and setting. Moses is going about his way. You see the burning bush. And he looks, and there's something interesting about where the Bible says Moses turned aside and said, I will go see here. There was something about him that said, I'm going to move towards this. I believe many people be like, oh, look at that bush that's on fire. Isn't that interesting? I got I got somewhere to be, and I'm moving on. There's something about him that wanted to not only see, but move towards some kind of encounter that was happening here and then realizing the um, unbelievably powerful moment where he encountered God in the writing in Exodus that, that brings out. And so in that, God says, I want to use you. And Moses has a lot of yeah buts, which is what you have in your journey, don't you? God wants to use you. Yeah, but I don't have a good education. Yeah, but I don't have this. And Moses is like, I've got this uh, speech issue. I, 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 I have trouble t- talking. There's, there's a fear, anxiety issue over speaking. There is a fear of man. There's a fear of failure. There's an anxiety issue that rises up here. There's an insecurity that Moses has. And God has this powerful moment. Show me what's in your hand. All these things that he's, that he's working, right? And showing his miraculous power. And Moses is still stuck. And God goes, all right, we'll use Aaron, all right? And we look, we, it's interesting how we look at the law in the Old Testament, the law is the, the harshness of it, right? But yet within law, we see grace relationship where God is calling for grace relationship. And this isn't a, fa- God doesn't operate with us in accordance to a failure mentality, even though we think we do. If we read the Old and New Testament under rules, regulation, and law, we don't see the heart of God in the midst of it all. We don't see his heart. We don't see the emotional aspect. And he says to Moses, all right, I'll work with you. Now, 
<laughs> we go, man, God in his consuming fire, and he declares he's going to use Moses, and Moses responds with, yeah, 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 but, right? In another passage, in another story, we see a guy named Gideon, and he's basically hiding behind a tree, and he's like, I don't want to do any of this, <laughs> Right? A lot of times, people who God uses, they didn't sign up for it. They didn't sit there and go, today I'm going to be a world changer and I'm going to do this. A lot of times, the people God uses are the ones that are like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not signing the, the form to, to say, I want to be on that. I'm just, just doing my thing. And in that moment where Moses is letting his fears take over, you'd kind of think God will go, okay, see you later, moving on. God works for them. He goes, all right, you you have Aaron as your sidekick. He can be like, you know, you can go into Aaron's ear and then Aaron can go, Pharaoh, let my people go, right? Notice though, God works with him. Notice when it comes time to speak, you don't see him using Aaron as his spokesperson. He steps up to the plate in the moment, right? Who he is rises up. And so, so many of us, we have a fear of failure that causes us not to step up. And there's things that disqualify us. Moses in that moment says, my speech issue, my stuttering, my, my fear issue is disqualifying me. And so many of you look at your, your life and your journey, go, this disqualifies me from being able to be used by God or moving forward. But you see when the time arises, Moses puts away fear rises up. So it's interesting how he's known as the most humble man on the face of the earth, but at the same time, he's got these anger issues, right? We see Moses listed in the hall of faith, but he also had this anger that took over. And he also had a moment in his journey where he got into a pattern. There was a moment where he struck the rock and water flowed out of it. And there was a moment where God says, I want you to speak to the rock now. And you can read in context where you see, you see the people, Moses was constantly getting agitated by the people, right? And, um, you know, we could easily play armchair quarterback and evaluate, well, oh, Moses, he lost his temper, he gets overwhelmed, this and that, right? You try to lead that large mass of people like that. We're all, they're all coming to you for advice. They're all coming to you for counsel, Right. I remember Jethro, his father-in-law, saying, hey, you need to get some people that break this down. You need some management organization here because this is getting out of control, right? So there's moments where you see Moses getting frustrated, where his anger could take over, right? But there's this beautiful humility. So humility doesn't mean you don't get angry. Meekness doesn't mean that you don't get angry. There's this powerful exchange Moses has that's very strange, where God is sick of it. And in the Old Testament scriptures, I I say this to a lot of people, we have a hard time seeing the angry side of how we see the Lord God relating. We have a hard time with that. But I'd like to take a step back for a second and say to you, when you watch the news and something bugs you and you get upset at it, right? You go, this is wrong. And you get passionate about it. We don't, we don't often question that. Now, some just get you know overwhelmed with the anger, and we're like, ah, oh, it's getting out of control. When you watch people being hurt, murdered, or when you see wrongs being done, clear wrongs being done, or values going astray, or you see moral decay in society, you get upset. So why is it that when we see God getting upset over, over patterns of not like making mistakes going left and going right of massive disobedience taking place where God, his heart aches and there's a grieving. And yes, there's, there's, there's an anger and there's a firmness. You know, I, I, as a parent, there are moments with my children. I have a, you have a firmness that's needed. And if you don't, it's unloving. It's unloving to not have healthy boundaries. You see, a lot of things that I realize is that we have a hard time with seeing the firmness of God and his holiness and in these stern moments in scripture because we lack a healthy perspective of that in our upbringing. Growing up, we weren't taught 
the power of love that involves loving acceptance, patience, kindness. There's within it discipline. There's, but throughout it all, relational equipping. What you see in the Old Testament, we want to look at it through Okay, God sets these rules, right? And then you're like, wait, but he does this with this person. I don't know, that doesn't make sense. Because yes, there is law, but there's also moments where he works relationally. So getting back to the the question here, he speaks to the rock. I'm sorry, he strikes the rock. And then he's told to speak to the rock. And the next time, I, as I'm reading, I sense this agitation. The people are getting to him. His anger takes over and he strikes it. Water comes out. And it's like he's working out of that. What we notice here, we have to look back and we have to see the picture here of what's happening. There's many, many applications we could take out of this story. Uh, We could talk about him kind of getting into a formula. I'm just going to do this thing and do it. We could say he's getting into, I'm doing it my way or he's getting stubborn or or whatever. One of the things I, I pick out here is this relational disconnect because God's wanting to work in relationship. Hey, this, um, this, this, the, the striking happened here. This time we're going to do it this way, which mirrors how we see the life of Christ, where every time he healed somebody and worked with somebody, it was like a different path. Once you stuck, put the rule, the, the rule book on do this a plus B in C, he'd kind of break the rule book. He'd tell this person, this thing, he would minister to this person that way. It was just like this this ebb and flow because it was out of relationship. So every person in the Old Testament under law that God, you see these significant interactions with, you see God operating out of relationship. You see him working with Jeremiah, who's known as the weeping prophet. He was young, he was afraid, had a fear issue. Don't be afraid of their faces, he says. Jeremiah had a fear of man issue too. He had a fear of failure, he had an intimidation issue. I don't know if I'm up for the job. And he became the weeping prophet, meaning he was going to warn and warn people of Israel, come back to God, come back to God, come back to God, come back to God. And then he had to watch them get under bondage and lament over it. That's a tough job. And Jeremiah manifests the aching heart of God. So we get lost in a failure mentality in the Old Testament. We don't see the heart. We don't see the relational aspect. And sometimes when you take a step back and go, put yourself in those shoes, put yourself in those situations, learn to see the insight that was available. So God says, all right, you're not going into the promised land. And many people can hyperventilate and go, oh my goodness, if I make a mistake, God will disqualify me and say, you're done. So we could look at this story and say, Moses is done. It's over with. But if I was sitting down with Moses, the first thing that I would, because the person asking this question is asking me, what, how would you advise him? First, I have an awareness. I would want to have an awareness that all of us have failures. All of us have areas of our life that we could look at as failures. We could look at areas of our life that disqualify us, that could disqualify us from whatever, from moving forward or, and for many people, their past haunts them in a way of disqualifying them. And what we're needing is we're needing relational grace because grace is God, his power, working in and through us. Grace is always pointing to relationship, to journey. Even within the context of evil and wickedness, the Bible says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In this, in this wickedness, God looks. In the times of Egypt, uh, Israel in Egypt, he looks for people with a heart. Even in the time of judges, he looks for people with heart and uses judges. Even times of where the prophets, where the kings are going, bad king, good king, bad king, good king, right? And, and when God was working in, in ways where they were disobedient, it wasn't, it, it wasn't it, you know, we kind of look at it as like, oh, they're just turning left when they should have turned right. No, this was like a whole pattern where entire groups, families as a nation were moving in a direction of 
resisting God's ways and saying no to him. And, and there's an ache there and God's calling them and calling them. That's why the Old Testament is so long. It's, it's a lot of God calling them, calling them, not listening. There's a beauty of grace even in Moses' journey because God says to Moses, I want to bring Israel all to this mountain to worship me. That's grace. That's relationship. All. The, the blueprint was not for Moses to just go up. The blueprint was for Israel to all be there. What does Israel do? They go, we got a good idea. Let's throw a big party and melt all our gold and let's worship these images we'll create. That sounds amazing, right? Which shows you how people can go in such deceived tangents in these goofy thoughts we that 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 are come up with. God's heart was actually for all of Israel to come to the mountain to worship, to have intimacy with him. And what does Israel say? Israel chooses law. They go, nah, Moses, you go up, you go up. That, 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 this stuff that's happening to you, that freaks us out. That's, we're, yeah. You go up, you, you listen to the God person and come back and tell us what he says and we'll listen to you. When God's original blueprint was, I want you all to understand how to connect to me. See, in both Old and New Testament, we have to see the thread of grace. Because it's always there. Even in the beginning when Adam and Eve sinned and darkness and oppression and satanic demonic influence is unleashed into the world. God still walks in the cool of the garden and says, Adam, where are you? He calls out for a relationship. He uses a guy like Samson with all kinds of issues. <laughs> uses a prostitute, uses, it's, it's amazing the grace that you can see. So the, one of the things I would, in talking to Moses, is as one, we all have issues that can disqualify us. It humbles us. Today in Christianity, we get very, very judgmental. And we have a failure mentality in how we operate with people. And what disqualifies them, and we forget the issues of our own heart. So humility is important in this process. And so I'd want to, I'd first want to learn from Moses about his humility. I'd want to extract what he's learned, what made him the most humble man on the planet, what made him. Now, let me circle back to something I said earlier. God gets into a place where he's fed up and he goes, Moses, you know what? That's it. We're just going to destroy Israel, and we're going to start new, me and you, me and you. <laughs> right? We're like, some of us would have been like, yeah, you know what? I'm sick of these people too. Do it. Start over, me and you, because I'm good, right? And these people. And Moses, he says no, and, and stands in an intercessory place. Says no, God. Wow, that's an interesting moment right? And in our like perfectionistic rules and like we want the formulas everywhere, right? We go, whoa, whoa, whoa. that kind of tilts things, right? What is God having second thoughts? Like, what, what is this? Wait, what, what's going on? Wait, Moses, had, oh, what, right? Relationship. Relationship. And you see, even in the seed of Messiah, generation after generation, there is from Abraham and his fear issues, his lying issues, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're liars. They're deceivers. They're all kind of mess. Jacob and Esau, problem after problem after problem. And God still works through these threads. Now, are there repercussions for decisions? Yeah. And what we have to do is we have to look at these things soberly. But here's the thing. God uses us in our mistakes, bad decisions, and struggles. He comes in and takes and wants to make new. He is a redeemer 
to bring back, to buy back. And he did it even in the Old Testament under law. The beauty is we now live in a new covenant where grace is so available. Where sin abound, grace abounds more. God's ability to work with us relationally. So whatever you feel like disqualifies you in your bad decisions, grace says now is the time. Today is the day. Today is a new day, a new opportunity. It is a new chance for you to rise up and to learn. One of the things in approaching Moses, I would say, is I wouldn't have a failure mentality. I don't believe God has a failure mentality with us. We could look at that striking the rock instead of speaking as failure right? We could. But I don't believe God has a failure mentality because even in where he makes that decision, there's something similar that happens to Elijah when Jezebel hits him. I'm going to kill you, Elijah. He does the miracle at Mount Carmel and Jezebel gets ripped and goes, I'm going to do to you and sends message to him. And so Elijah comes under this. It's what's often taught as a spirit of Jezebel. It's uh, uh, intimidation, manipulation, control, uh, fear, just a wave of it hitting, right? And he loses, he loses who he is. He spirals. He's fatigued. He's tired. He's hungry. He's overwhelmed. He's depressed. He goes into self-pity. And in that place, God shows up. Relationship. Because God could have gone, eh, you missed it. You're out. God still shows up to him and he's in pity and he's complaining and woe is me. And he's in total self-pity because the Jezebelic uh, hypnotic influences hit him. He's, he's disoriented and he's, he's forgot who he is. And God speaks to him, the still small voice, that whole scenario and still doesn't, doesn't catch what's happening here. And new directions happen. We see the, you see the transition where Elijah's ministry starts to fade out and Elisha's ministry comes on the scene in greater measure. So I have to remember that in all things, God's grace is here. You may have decisions where, man, you lost a marriage out of decisions you made. There's disconnect with children. It might have been in ministry where something happened. You had to step aside for a season. Or maybe you had to step aside altogether. Maybe you made decisions that affected people in significant ways. Today is a day for God's grace to be available. Shame will tell you you're completely disqualified. You're done. It's over. So with those things in mind in talking to Moses, I would say, first of all, I'd want to recognize my own areas. I'd want to learn from him about his humility. I'd want to, I'd always keep in my mind, there is no failure with God, only learning. There is no failure with God, only learning. So I say, what have you learned so far? Because I would kind of feel like, Moses, are you burnt out? This is a lot. This is a lot. I would also celebrate with Moses all that God's done through his life. I would just take a pause and just reflect on that. And I think these writings that, that, that we see of what Moses wrote, there's much reflection within that too. And I would celebrate how a guy who was thrown into a little riverbank and raised in luxury and influence decided to step out and be a spokesperson, a guy with anger issues, who had fear issues, all kinds of things that could disqualify him, could disqualify me, and disqualify you. Same issues that Timothy had in the New Testament. Timothy had anxiety issues. Paul had to tell him, God has not given you the spirit of fear, and stir up the gift that is in you, because that's what fear wants to do. And those of you that listen to my materials on anxiety and so forth, I get into a lot of the technicalities of it, also the biblical precepts, the mental health aspects. But a lot of times what anxiety is wanting to do is prevent the gift of God from just being stirred up within us because everyone has grace gifts in your life. They just need to be sometimes called out, tapped into, stirred up, encouraged, as Paul did to Timothy. 
and encourage him to stir up that gift that is within him. I want to remind you, Timothy, when I laid hands on you, that was a moment of God depositing in your life. And as a father speaking to a son, he's believing in him. Don't let fear overtake you. And it's the same word I'd bring to you today. And if I was sitting down with um, Moses, we can say, you know what? Let's learn here. Because just because there's a transition happening doesn't mean you can't learn here. And maybe we'd learn, yeah, there are issues in our life that if we just ignore them, they can be un- they can they can hinder the beauty of of what's available in the next chapter. For example, I realized in my life in my journey that if I didn't do business with self-pity, it was going to prevent me from moving forward. It was going to prevent me from what was available because I would cope with resistance and challenges in my life with pity, victim mentality, self-loathing versus helpful grieving and even mourning and learning to work through my emotions and find the empowering place. I realized if I was going to, if, if fear was going to be the boss of my life, it was going to prevent me from moving into the next season of my life. I think there's aspects of Moses' anger, Moses' impatience that revealed this is going to get in the way in the next season. But it's a mixture. It's a mixed bag. It's not just, Moses, you failed. You're out. Okay, uh, I got to find somebody. Hmm, God's like, oh. I, th- I really think the time for transition was already happening because Joshua was the man to take the next level. Joshua carried the faith. It was the next season. So the biggest thing I would see here, this isn't about failure. This is bringing about, you know those moments where, you realize a season's changing. You know, something's happening here. And it's a clue that it's time to move on, time to move into the next chapter. And this is a signal for time of transition. Time to move into the new. So when you don't look at it with a failure mentality, you may see there's there's a handoff here to the next generation. Or you may need to see this is a time of transition and season. For example... Many people, when I would talk to about the time where I ended my uh, institutional church pastoring, where I not only left that role, but also closed the church I was pastoring. There are many pastors and people that would consider that a failure. You had to close the church, Mark, because it failed. If I saw it that way, I probably wouldn't even be here where I am right now. Because I would have said, Yeah, it's done. But I actually saw the tension and the things that were happening in my life and in the church were revealing to me this season's coming to a close, the new is arriving, and I need to welcome that. I could have looked and said, well, I miss God. I didn't do this. I didn't do that, right? And that's why the church, we can come up with all kinds of things. If I have a failure mentality, If I have a learning mentality, I learn and I am able to step into the next season. And for Moses, there's probably signals that this there's there's a season coming to a close. And Moses, like, well, I led them out. I'm gonna see this thing all the way to the end. And I'm gonna, you know, and there's a picture of the new that's happening. And so I'd I'd remind him there's a handoff that was needed to happen here anyway. And the situation brought it out. And yes. Your, your pattern took over, you worked in your, because there's a lot of times too, we get stuck in our rhythms. We, we don't hear what God is doing in that fresh season. I have my certain methodologies and things that I do, but I have to always within things, just tune into God's heart for that season and how I work with people and how I work with my life and my journey, because he's always upgrading us. He's always bringing us to new levels. Remember the theme is relational, Right? relational and God in the old and the new you see him working relationally with people and he wants to do that with you the last thing I would say is Moses this doesn't change at all the beauty of your story and your journey and I would honor that I would honor that and remind him of that and I would say you know what Moses 
give a lot of encouragement to Joshua and provide for him everything you've learned because that's going to make what you've been through redemptive. Take what you've learned. If you've had divorces, tell people what you've learned. That, or, or, or you've had um, experiences or you've had breaches with your children. You've had certain sin issues. Let the learning happen so be a deposit for others. So every area of my life that has been hell I've gone through, I've, I'm, I'm going to allow it to be the heaven that I offer to you. God brings beauty in everything. Moses is in the Hebrews hall of faith. Yet with failure mentality, we look and go, he's disqualified. You're out, canceled, <laughs> right? Wipe his whole history out. Mm-mm. Nope. Within the realm of Israel picking a king and they pick this good looking guy, Saul, who kind of fits the political scene and he kind of fits that role. And people are like, yeah, that's what we should have within that context, within law and prophets. God looks and says, I see a man after my own heart. And the people that write to me and share with me their story and their journey, they might be struggling with OCD, anxiety, uh, performance-driven relationship with God, punishment-based relationship with God, legalism, perfectionism, all this stuff, right? What I see as a common thread in so many of you is heart. I want to be connected with God. I want to hear his heart and move in his heart. I want to sense that. But you've gotten bogged down by all this stuff, right, that has taken over. All these people in the Bible are good reminders that God uses us in the midst of our goofiness. David had an out-of-control lust problem. He's got murder on his rap sheet. He's got lying and deception. Still, man, after God's own heart. He had a dream to build the temple. That got transitioned to his son. Right? So see, what we see as failure can actually be learning handoffs to the next generation. So to answer this question is, I don't believe in a failure mentality. Everything is learning. So therefore, don't be afraid of failing because it's not about failing. What would you do in your life if there is no failure? Because in all your bad decisions, goofiness, sins, struggles, you're still, you have heart that wants to find the better way, the more excellent way, which Paul said the more excellent way is love. Learning to live in that love and that grace, that grounds us. So it pushes shame back. So now I'm not spinning and spiraling, trying to like hide. I hope no one knows about this thing in my life. No, it's for the learning. And now my learning I offer to you. Here's what I've been through. Here's what I've learned. What I have, I give to you. So that's my response to this question. I pray it's an encouragement to your life and to your journey. You can go and do some biblical searches. I pinpoint and hit so many areas you can look up for yourself. Which part of my talk today has been encouragement to where you're at and what you're going through in helping you navigate your healing and freedom journey? If this has been a blessing to your life, go to markdehesus.com. Please let me know. You can email me, mark at markdehesus.com. Let me know, hey, that hit home and this is how it hit home for me. That helps me as a teacher know what's helping people and how it's helping them. Feel free to comment on this. I look forward to seeing you more future episodes. So keep in mind, I am your brother from another mother. And Lord willing and the creek don't rise, I'll be back with some more insights for your healing and freedom journey. And I pray that you're blessed by this. Be encouraged in grace, be encouraged in love. Let the truth set you free today and go live it out. Love you. See y'all next time. I'm out.